Thank you everyone for coming to my talk. I'm a little bit hearing about what you all do. I'm uh, curious to get your take on what we're going to talk about today because I feel like I'm going to touch on some things that some of you might know uh, maybe even a little bit better than me. So we'll see. Um, this is sort of a repeat of a talk that I gave to the machine learning meetup uh, way back in 2013. So it's been about five years and I kind of updated it a little bit, but there's still a lot that I think that uh, I could do with kind of the idea that, um, that I stumbled upon in this talk. And um, so maybe we'll get a chance to talk about this. I hope we have a discussion at the end. Um, but before we get into that, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I worked the, as a machine learning engineer for, at uh, Foursquare from uh, 2011 to this past February. And first few years I was there, I was working on Foursquare's recommendation engine, you know, uh, which is a, a city guide. So it's like people are giving reviews to a restaurant. Um, uh, sh should I recommend this restaurant or not? And when diving into those problems, that's sort of where I kind of got interested in these statistical distributions. I mean, a little bit before when I was uh, diving into machine learning in grad school, but uh, definitely this came out of um, sort of real practical work. And then I dove into a rabbit hole of something a little more, um, maybe a little more, uh, maybe a little more pure, a little bit more, uh, but you know, you know, solely for the interest of it. But it definitely started from some of the practical work and you'll see in a little bit. And so that talk was in 2013. I um, will we'll see how different this one is. <laughs> Maybe we can compare the two. Um, and currently, uh, so I did a lot for, at Foursquare since then. I worked on MarsBot, which is our chatbot app. I worked on attribution on ads, which is a causality model, which is a whole different um, ball game when it comes to probability. And I'm currently a machine learning engineer at Luminary Media, which is a podcasting company. So now I'm taking uh, the recommender system con uh, concept and instead of applying it to locations, I'm applying it to p p podcasts. And the reason why that appealed to me is because last year I started my own podcast. It's called Local Maximum. And you said I get to promote this, so I'm going to yeah, promote yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> it's, a, yeah. it's a weekly tech yeah, podcast, uh, and, and I host it. And you can go to the website. It's localmaxradio.com. Sort of, I'm sort of kind of still playing around with the ideas, but I think the idea is I bring up concepts that I've learned, and I talk to people that I've met in my life and at my jobs, and I, I use that to better understand the world. So I went back and looked at what my mo most mathy episodes are, and most of them have to do with math or technology, but one episode which I really liked a lot was the episode 39, which is called Paradox, and that was all about mathematical paradoxes. I didn't write that in there, but I kind of broke down a bunch of you know, uh, common paradoxes. Episode 31, I talked about uh, the problem of causality. That's a very popular one with uh, the, uh, the chief data scientist at um, McGraw-Hill. And then in episodes 21 and 22, I talked about uh, subjective probability and Bayesian inference, so that stuff, and, and kind of dive into the philosophy of it a little bit. So I think that stuff will appeal to some of you here. And sometimes we just take the ideas from machine learning. We don't necessarily go into, like I, I won't necessarily go into, it, it's not like attending a lecture. It'll be more like, well, we have this idea of underfitting and overfitting in machine learning, and so in one episode, I was like, "Okay, well, what's it like for, what's it like when you meet a person who's constantly overfitting or a person who's constantly underfitting? What would that person be like?" And kind of think about that a little bit more. So, and then there are some episodes like the one that's going to come out today, where I just rant about Facebook for sixty minutes. So <laughs> that, <laughs> that happens too, uh, but uh, yeah, those tend to be pretty popular. Okay, so a couple goals for this talk before we begin. First of all, I've got to describe the Dirichlet distribution. I don't uh, assume that anyone knows what it is. Um, many of you who've done uh, statistical distributions before, if you don't know what it is, you probably have used something very similar or something kind of related to it. Um, and then some intuition tricks that I have in order to understand what's going on when you change the parameters. Um, I wish I had like little animations and stuff, but just to keep it simple, I have slides, but I think I can describe this pretty well. Um, 
then I motivate the problem of getting a Bayesian prior for some data. And then I go through the math for a fast solution that I have to find the, uh, the, the, the right, the optimal, well, what that means we'll get to in a second, but the optimal Bayesian prior for, uh, for a set of count data. So don't worry if you're a little bit lost on these, we'll get into them in a little bit. Uh, so first, I'm going to start with a little bit of a warm-up because I think that there's something really satisfying to me as, a, you know, as someone who writes software and algorithms. Uh, there's something very satisfying about the algorithm for computing the mean of a group of numbers. So algorithm, pretty simple. You keep a running tally of the sum of the numbers that you've seen so far, and you keep a running tally of the count. And after all the data has passed through your machine, then you have everything you need. So I like to draw these machines. This one I like, it's called the mean machine. And you've got, uh, on one hand, you've got the sum of everything you've seen so far. And then the other hand, you've got the count of everything you've seen so far. And so my visualization of how this algorithm works is some numbers come in. And then each time a number comes in, both of these values get updated. So this is 6.6 .6 was the last one. And you get the minus three, maybe a zero for good measure. So the sum doesn't change. And then there we go. We could find the average of all these numbers just by dividing these two at the end, and we get 1.4. So why is this so satisfying to me? What are some of the properties here that I kind of notice? So one is that you only need one pass through the data. That's pretty cool. A lot of algorithms, a lot of machine learning algorithms, you need many, many passes. Um, two, you only need to store two numbers. You need to store one real number, that's the sum and you need to store one natural number, that's the count. And so that's pretty nice. It's a really small memory footprint. Um, and actually, it doesn't even have to be a real number. The algorithm can extend to any vector space because really all you have to do is add them together and then uh, divide at the end. So if we're willing to make the count a non-integer, we can also expand this to having some kind of a weighted mean. So maybe like instead of adding one each time, we can have a different thing that we add. And so that's another thing we can do with this. And a final thing that we could do is we can stop early if our data set is too big, and then we can still get a reasonable answer. So, um, and by the way, uh, we have a pretty small group, so just feel free to like interrupt me and um, ask a question as we go, because I want to make sure you guys are still with me. Um, Okay, so what are some other questions? I don't know why sometimes my last word gets cut off, but maybe I just uh, was doing it very quickly last night. But here's some other questions that I have about this. So the first, which I'm not really going to answer, but what does the median machine look like? And the answer is not nearly as nice. <laughs> That's why I picked the mean machine. Uh, it can be done, but um, it requires multiple passes through the data. Um, if you study, you know, Computer science, al uh, algorithms, data structures, you could probably tell me, oh, I have a fast algorithm for that, but still, it's not as nice. So another question I have is, what happens if the machine is turned off before any data is passed through it? And the third question is, well, that's nice. What other problems can be solved this nicely? Because oftentimes, we're kind of given a difficult problem, and it's like, okay, we've got to do all this difficult stuff with it. It doesn't get solved nicely. And so rather than trying to figure out, can I solve this difficult problem more nicely, it would be nice to have, in my mind, kind of a toolkit of problems that are solved really elegantly so that I have in my mind like what that toolkit is so that um, I can recognize it in the future. So in this question, what I'm talking about here is, okay, what if I say right now, hey, I'm done giving you my list of numbers, now it's time for you to compute the, uh, <laughs> compute the mean. I love doing this to computers, right? Okay, so yeah, you've got the division by zero. Um, and a solution that a lot of programmers come up with is a smoothing solution. So hey, I'm just gonna add like a little point one to the count, that way all of my answers are still gonna be relatively um, relatively similar to what they were before, but now I can't get this divide by zero error. So now it works. And so that 
seems like it's, and, and it's probably true, like someone just made that up. Oh, just add 0 0.1 or even like just add like 0 0.0001 and that way we don't have to worry about, you know, a divide by zero error and um, everything's good. And then the question is, okay, well, is there actually a justification for smoothing like this? Because we do a lot of smoothing all the time. Um, and so that's when I, we kind of step back and you kind of want to consider what you're actually doing. So what you're actually doing in a, a lot of these cases where you want to compute the mean is you, you want to compute the mean over this giant data set of which you have a sample. And you sort of have in your mind, okay, what is, I, I, I want to know like what is, maybe I, I can't know what the true mean is, but I want to know instead what is a probability distribution over the real numbers that encodes my belief of what the mean is. And then as I get more and more data, as I get more and more numbers into my machine, I'm going to use Bayes' rule to update that belief and receive a new data point. So did I put Bayes' rule here? Ah, uh, yeah, OK, I did. So here's a good example. So Bayes' rule is on the bottom right. How many of you are familiar with this? Let's see. Just about everyone, so I don't have to, okay, great. I don't have to go, go too much over it, so I'll just state it. The probability of the hypothesis given the, so if you have multiple hypotheses that you're trying to test out, in this case it's what is my mean, uh, the probability of the hypothesis given the data that you see is, the, is, if you look in the bottom one, it's proportional to the probability of the data given each hypothesis times the prior probability of that hypothesis. So. Oftentimes, the, um, the denominator in Bayes' rule, we can just drop out um, because it's, and then you normalize at the end because it's just a constant. So, okay, let's say I have a prior distribution over um, what my mean is, um, and I think it's kind of distributed normally. So I have a mean, and I have a standard deviation, and then I'm given this new point Z, I know that it stands for complex numbers, but I was thinking last night, what should I do? And I already had an X there, so. But let's say I get this new number in here. And then, okay, let's try to plug this into Bayes' rule and see what happens. So the prior probability before that number, that P of H, that, that second term, is just gonna be that normal distribution. Um, and that first term is the probability of the data um, given the hypothesis. So that's also, you know, something proportional to the normal distribution. And then you do a little algebra. This part is not too important. But, you know, you get to something like this and you get another distribution. And then you have to normalize it. But note that the resulting distribution that you get is now no longer a normal distribution. So that kind of sucks. It's just going to get more and more complicated as you get more and more data in here. So the big question is, wouldn't it be nice if the posterior distribution were in the same form as the prior? And when that happens, it's called a conjugate prior. For this specific problem, it does exist, but it's a little bit more complicated. To make it work nicely, you need to consider both your uncertainty over the mean and the standard deviation at the same time. Uh, but today, we're going to look at another example that I think is actually a little simpler, which is the Dirichlet distribution. So um, that's the answer to whether the problems can be solved this nicely. Um, okay, so this is the Dirichlet distribution, uh, and my point on this slide is I don't expect anyone to get what's going on in this uh, <laughs> sea of symbols. Uh, so we're going to start with something simpler, which is sort of a discrete distribution or a categorical distribution, which is just, hey, you have a certain number of categories. In this case, there are five different categories, and they're each assigned a probability, and those probabilities add up to one. Um, and so technically, that's called a categorical distribution. If you sample from it a bunch of times, and then you want to know, OK, how's the, uh, how, how are the samples going to play out? That's called a multinomial distribution. It's sort of the the multi-dimensional analog to the binomial distribution. But I sort of use them interchangeably sometimes because I get them confused. But what I have in my mind here is just a simple, discrete, finite 
thing. Um, and so the types of things that I would see when I worked at Foursquare, for example, where you know, people were registering their likes and dislikes of a place. And so <laughs> you have one place you know, on the left where, and this is my example from all the way back in 27 where, uh, 2011, where it was the, the bookstore near our office was, had a 94.9% you know, like rate and the rest were dislikes. And then the post office near where I lived at the time had a 92.9% dislike rate. I always love that example. That, these, that, that was actually the best and worst in Manhattan when I measured at that particular time. Um, and it was funny because I'd heard of both places. Um, so, okay. So this is, the, this is a, just a binomial category. Um, and so more formally, I think this is, uh, well, can you see the one on the left? It just means that they add up to one. It's a probability distribution. There are K different categories that will be hopefully consistent throughout the talk. And um, there are K different probabilities. So how do you imagine this probability space? And the way I imagine it is it kind of lives on a probability simplex. So at th this is the three-dimensional case. So you can see the point in the middle is one-third, one-third, one-third. And then at the corners, there is a 100% probability of um, a single situation happening. I found this picture online last night. So, but I thought it was pretty good. Um, the three-way case, the trinomial case is, um, is sort of interesting to me from Foursquare's perspective because we actually made our rating system a little bit more complicated. We had likes, dislikes, and it's okay. There was like a middle option. And so we wanted to know where people were in that simplex of percentage of likes, percentage of dislikes, and percentage of, of, of mixed reviews. And so if you have 100% of people all in one category, you're going to be in one of the corners. Um, and then most venues fall somewhere in the middle here. And then higher dimensional simplexes, well, you can't really picture it in your head, but you, know, it, it, you could kind of take this picture and say it looks something like this. So excuse me, for yeah. every point, all the three coordinates would have to add up to one. Exactly. To one the yeah, so it's yeah. like you take, you take those points 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and then you kind of connect them all to in a plane. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's the space of multinomial distributions. So again, we kind of went up two levels, right? Because we started off with a space of three distinct points. And we said, what does a probability distribution over that space looks, look like? Well, it's three numbers that add up to one. Um, and then we went one step above that and said, OK, of these categorical distributions, what does that space look like? And then it's this two-dimensional uh, continuous thing. Does that, are you guys getting what I just said in that concept? OK, good. All right. So, um, some more examples from, um, because a lot of times what we did with our data at Foursquare is we'd take continuous data and we'd bucket it and so it would become discrete. And so in this case, this was visits to the Museum of Modern Art and we looked at just the time of week. And so that's why there are 168 hours in a week and we sort of divided them up uh, within each hour to see when people were visiting and what their percentages. It closed on Tuesday sometimes, so that's why that's a lot less. Um, a lot of people like to go on the weekends. And so this is, I had a lot of 168 dimensional categorical distributions. Which, your, which day is what? I mean, is that fri Friday, Saturday, and Sunday? Yeah, Friday, Saturday, it's and Sunday. It's also open much later. Yeah. Open much later. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fridays and Saturdays. Yeah, yeah. I take you have a bar for each specific hour within the day. Uh, a bar. These bars represent specific hours. Yeah, yeah. Each one is each one is an hour. So this leads to my favorite pie chart of all time. That one. <laughs> you can see what happens each hour. So that's the multinomial distribution. Same same data. All right. Um, yeah. And at Foursquare, and particularly at the time when I first gave this talk back in 2013, like I just had 
and, and I still have lots of talks with these where I just look at tons and tons of data on this is mentions of burgers versus pancakes. <laughs> and I had, I had like a tool where I can look at the, and I have a whole talk on this. It's, it's, it's online about, you know, I could look at different countries and different key terms. <laughs> and it was actually a lot of fun to look at that data. For, unfortunately, I left Foursquare a few, few months ago, so now I don't have access to that tool anymore. But uh, I wish I did. I took a lot of screenshots, though. Yeah, yeah. Well, one, one of the fun ones was like, you know, a, a couple of the fun ones that I can mention was like seeing how uh, searching, like looking at mentions of dinner in different countries, how like, you know, Italians eat dinner much later. The other one was looking at throughout the year because uh, we, we, we bucketed the year on the, um, the uh, search for fireworks and you kind of get a sense of which, when each country's big uh, <laughs> celebrations are. And so and stuff like that was really interesting. Piloting with emergency room visits the next day. Well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, there, there was one at Rexis where I had uh, the recommender systems conference where I had, because I thought it would play well to that audience, where I had one picture, I think it was on a poster, where it was like happy hour, drunk, and hangover. And you could see it like <laughs> up, up, up. Like, yeah. Okay. So, um, categorical distributions, the ones where you actually get the percentages, one thing I've noticed is those are actually rarely observed directly. I mean, yes, sometimes we're given, you know, this data where, hey, this is 92.9 and this is 7.1, but the reason why we got that is that actually someone was observing discrete likes and dislikes. They didn't have access to these exact numbers. Um, so um, that's what I mean by that. And so if M samples are drawn from a, multi, uh, from a categorical distribution, then the resulting possibilities among those M samples is now a multinomial distribution. And again, I get those two confused, but it, the difference between multinomial and categorical is just multinomial is what happens when you draw multiple samples. Um, okay, so this is kind of what the multinomial distribution looks like. Uh, I'm sure if you're not familiar with this, most of you are familiar with the binomial distribution. And so, um, you know, essentially the binomial coefficient is what's going on on the left when you have um, two probabilities, p and one minus p usually. And that's just the normalizing constant. Um, and then on the right is where the interesting stuff is going on. Essentially, if I draw another, um, it, you know, if I know what my probabilities are of each, uh, each category, and then, you know, I draw another sample from it and I get category K, then the probability overall has to be multiplied by the probability of that category. And that's why it's P to the I to the X to the I, where X to the I is the count of that, um, of, of, of samples from that category that I got. So, okay, this is what raw count data looks like um, in a lot of data sets. So this could be an example of, you know, for example, a lot of four square venues um, where you're observing all the people who rated the venue. There are two possible ratings in this case, not three um, like we later had, but in each case, you get a number of likes and a number of dislikes. And essentially what you get is the matrix of counts. And so using the, uh, the three kind of, uh, the, the naming scheme that I'm using here is that there are K categories. So that's the number of columns. So in this case, K equals two because it's likes and dislikes. There are N rows of data and then um, M is usually the number of, uh, usually the maximum number of uh, pulls uh, of, of uh, samples from each row. I take M as a constant if you're taking the same number of samples from each row, or in this case, it could be, you know, M sub I, where, you know, the first row has, let's see, I gotta add my head now, uh, 254 uh, samples and so on and so forth. The last row has two samples. Um, so, 
the obvious point is that counts is not equal to the, doesn't give you the actual distribution, but you can pretty much infer it. So in this case, now we have three categories. I have a whole lot of samples in that first row there. So I can be pretty uh, confident about what the overall distribution is going to be in that row. So I could just look at the sum, 750. I sampled from that row, from that distribution, 750 times. And now I get a pretty good, what I think is going to be, you know, making all the correct uh, statistical assumptions, of course, that it's like, you know, we're taking random samples and all that. I have a pretty good idea of what the overall, you know, categorical distribution is going to be for that row. It might not be exactly that, but I think it's going to be pretty close. Could be improved. Yeah, sorry? Could be improved because you're dealing oh, with so. a bias and ratio estimator. Yes. That's the ratio estimator. Yes. And, known to be biased. and this is, yeah, and this is, <clears throat> this talk is going to okay. get into one way of dealing with that. Uh, so, yeah, so this is what, and, and it's through the, these cases where, you know, you have less data, and of course you know that um, these are going to be uh, not very good. You know, in this case, it's like, is yellow 50%? Well, no, this could be, you know, this could be taken on a uniform distribution, a third, a third, a third. I mean, some guy, someone's has to have two. Uh, and, uh, you know, so it's, in other words, there's this, a much wider array of um, uncertainty here over what that distribution is. And this one's even worse. That row can't be all yellow. Then this one's even worse where you can't even divide. So similar problem to what we had before. Well, the fourth, is the last one really worse? The last one you can just throw out. Right, right. There's nothing right. going on. You have no data. You have nothing to estimate. Right, right. And so the idea here is what we're going to try to do is instead of throw these out is can we have, instead of, actually estimating the probability distribution, um, can we have a distribution of distributions? In other words, can we have like a, a sort of Bayesian idea over which distribution we have? And that's, that's where the Dirichlet essentially comes in. So that's where we have Bayesian statistics to the rescue. We still assume that each row is generated by some multinomial distribution, some distribution of, of three. Again, I know a lot of you probably have like different ways of talking about this. I'm not really um, as, uh, uh, well, I'm interested in kind of getting your, your, your takes on this as, as we go through this. But um, we're going to assume that, yes, each row was, was um, produced by a multinomial distribution. But we just don't know which one. It could be any of these things. And so what the Dirichlet distribution is, is it's a probability distribution over all the possible multinomial distributions, P. So in other words, it's a probability distribution in the three-dimensional case. It's a probability distribution over this simplex, um, but it could be over any number of dimensions. So what this is, is it represents our uncertainty over the actual distribution that created the row. So. In this case, we'll come back to the equation again. So P, uh, the little p, represents the multinomial distribution um, that uh, you know, each multinomial distribution is, it's a probability, uh, it's probability mass function, a PMF. So each, uh, each, each point, each multinomial distribution is assigned uh, you know, a relative, uh, a relative score here. Um, the alphas, and you can see that alpha sub k minus 1, there, there are k of them, given k categories. That's the parameter of the Dirichlet. And yeah, and k is the number of categories. So just, I think I go through a little bit more of this later, but just to understand this better, all the key stuff is going on in that last term, the, the term on the end. The, um, the stuff on the, the, the middle term, the, the fraction, that is just the normalizing constant. If you, um, if you take the integral and integrate over the whole thing, 
that just makes sure that the whole thing integrates to one. Um, and that's, that's what that term is. And so really all the key stuff is happening on the, uh, in that product on the right. <coughs> Um, Max, could, you, could you pause for a second? Yes. Give us an intuition why the exponent on the right is alpha k minus one, whereas in the multinomial distribution you gave earlier, the, the exponent was, I guess, alpha k, analog of alpha k for the multinomial. Right, right. So I have, I have some things later. Let me make sure that. Yeah, if you get to that. Yeah, let me just make sure it's good enough. Uh, if I could just answer this quickly. So let's actually look at some examples. Let's suppose that all the alphas are set to one. They're positive numbers. If they're all set to one, then all the exponents are going to be zero. And that is going to be a, yeah, it's going to be a uniform distribution over that simplex. And as the alphas get higher and higher, um, and it, it turns into one thing, and then if it gets lower and lower, it turns into another thing. And this I'll get to in a little bit. I promise I'll get to it. Yeah. All right, so I, sh I probably should have put this here in the, in the slides, but let's see what happens here. So what's going to happen is, actually, this just explains what's going to happen. So if I have, if I'm given a Dirichlet distribution over what the, what the categorical distribution is going to be, and then I draw more samples from that categorical distribution and I get more data, and then I update it in a Bayesian way, the really nice thing is that the posterior distribution is also going to be a Dirichlet. So you don't have to leave this distribution as you do your Bayesian inference. So um, I'll show you this through some equations. So I'm looking at the probability of little p, which is... Um, which is categorical distribution, given the data, which means I pulled some samples out of that. Maybe if you think about the reviews, I pulled out some likes, I pulled out some dislikes, I pulled out some mixed reviews just randomly. Um, so I want to know, my, I want to get my distribution over the possible categorical distributions given my data. I use Bayes' rule to flip it around. So I have what's my probability of the data given uh, given P, and what's the probability of P given alpha? That's my um, Dirichlet distribution. I'm going to do everything unnormalized here. You just have to trust me that that's an okay thing to do. I've gone through all the equations, keeping it all normalized and making it an equal sign, and it works, but it's really, uh, it's really tedious. So um, what happens here is, so on the, on the right, you get your prior distribution, which is the Dirichlet, which again is just that, um, if you look at the middle equation, it's just that, that product. Um, and then uh, the term on the left, what's the probability of the data given any given categorical distribution P? Well, that's just the multinomial distribution there. And you can kind of tell why these equations work so nicely because they both put those uh, they, they both put those probabilities in the uh, base of the exponent. And so what happens in the next slide is that can be put together. And now you get this, um, uh, this product where you're adding the count of the number of things in that, um, in that category to uh, the existing parameter of the prior. And so I probably should have started with the intuition rather than the equation. We'll go to the intuition in a second. But if you look at the equations on the bottom, the prior is a Dirichlet with um, you know, alpha 0, alpha 1, all the way up to alpha k minus 1. And then the posterior, you're just adding the number from each sample that you're taking. So let's say I have a Dirichlet distribution. Let's say I have three different categories. My Dirichlet is um, alpha 0, alpha 1, alpha 2. You know, every time I, I observe a point, let's say I observed a mixed review here, then that's my new Dirichlet distribution. So any questions on that? I hope that was, yeah. Where does the certainty of your prior come in? 
So the certainty of the prior? Well, sometimes your prior is just some random guess. Right. Sometimes your prior is based on 20 meta-analyses. Right. So, yes, you know. this, what we're going to get to is the meta-analysis, is how to get to the prior to begin with. Okay. So here I'm pre, I'm pre, um, yeah, I'm presupposing that you have a prior, and then it's like, okay, if I have a Dirichlet prior, you know, then how do I update it when I get more data in there? Um, and then the next part of the talk is actually going to be, okay, how do I actually get that prior? Okay. Which is, Max, I have which one. is pretty quick, cool. Quick, yeah. Quick, go for it. Dry. Your alphas are, are parameters or fractions between zero and one. Uh, well, they're, they're positive numbers. Yeah. They're positive numbers. Yeah, so. The simplex. Uh, no, no, no. The, the P, the P yeah. values are positive numbers in the simplex. The, the alphas are. Yeah, so the alphas are parameters in the distribution over the simplex. So you're adding one to a, so, some kind of index that relates to that. Right, right. But it's so. It's a positive number. Yeah, it's a no, positive it's number. Fraction. It's a positive mm -hmm. number. And it could be, yeah, it could be anything. All right. um, I forgot how hard this is. <laughs> okay, like I said before, this is the normalizing constant, so you don't have to worry about it. What's this part? This part is kind of breaking down the equation a little bit. Um, actually, I'm going to skip this part. Um, okay, so... I'm going to say, okay, let's uh, look at, now we have a Dirichlet machine similar to the, um, to the mean machine that we had before. So we had some distribution. Again, I'm, we're still a little uncertain over what the intuition for that distribution is, what's actually going on here. But we know what the math is telling us, and the math is telling us that uh, these three numbers define some prior over the simplex, and every time we observe another point, we update this. Okay, so here's where we get to, you know, what we can think of, of what this alpha vector really means. And so one way to think about this is to divide it into two sections. You can normalize it, and that actually gives you a probability distribution there. And then you could take the sum, which I kind of call the weight. Oh. The, the normalized part, and this is what's really nice, that is actually the expected value of the distribution. So it's a distribution over the simplex. This is where it's centered on. So in other words, in this case, it's centered on that point of the simplex where it's uh, 1, 6, 3, 6, and 2, 6. Um, so that's kind of nice. Um, and then what does the weight represent? Well, the weight, it's not actually... So in, when you think of a normal distribution, you have the standard deviation and you have the variance. You have something, one over the variance, which is the uh, precision. And the weight is actually not equal to the precision at all, but you could think of it in that way. As the weight goes up, it gets more and more centered around that point. And um, wh where can I go? Yeah. So. As the weight goes up, it looks a lot more like the blue line. And as the weight goes down, it looks a lot more like the gray line. It's like having a, a larger and larger standard deviation. So it's almost like a, a, a measure of certainty. And this is where the intuition comes in. As I'm getting more and more data into my distribution, uh, or I'm getting get more and more data into my Bayesian model, my Dirichlet parameters are going up and up and up. That means that my the, the my distribution becomes more and more peaked around um, what the expected value of those what the expected value of those parameter distributions are, of of those of of this distribution is. So that kind of makes sense. As I get more data, I become more certain over what the probability distribution is. As I get less data or if I have very little data, I'm very uncertain. So, so here's a couple of examples. Um, here are five <coughs> examples from a high weight Dirichlet distribution. So let's say that the expected value is 40% blues, 40% reds, and 20% yellows. 
Okay? Now, and let's suppose I observed so much that I am so certain that the distribution among those colors is going to be exactly this. Then every time, then, then all of my examples are going to look like pulled from that Dirichlet are going to look very similar. They're all going to have uh, that 40%, 40%, 20% breakdown. Now, what happens on the other side when the Dirichlet distribution gets very, very close to zero, if the weight gets very, very close to zero? Well, um, if you think about a normal distribution, right? If the standard deviation in normal distribution gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it kind of gets flatter and flatter and flatter and flatter. But in this case, what happens is, you know, it can't get flatter and flatter because we're on a simplex. So, I mean, it flattens out when, the, when uh, they're all ones, but then what happens is it kind of ends up climbing up the walls and you end up with something like this. So, you can see here that all of these distributions have 100% on one color. But if you average them together and you take, well, what's the average distribution here? Um, you're still going to get that 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.2. And so to me, that's the intuition between you know, a high weight distribution. I'm really uncertain as to what it is, or I'm really certain as to what I'm looking at here. Um, when you're kind of in the middle, near one, they're a little mixed up. And I should have had an example where it's near, near one, like a middleweight. And then when it's low weight down here, it's sort of like, well, it's, it's actually completely unmixed. So that would mean like, this would be an example, if, if I could just give an example. Let's suppose we lived in a world where every restaurant, it was either everyone liked it or everyone didn't like it. And it was 50-50. So before you gather any data, you don't really know if that restaurant's going to be any good. But as soon as you get your first review, you're like, okay, I know what this is. Boom. And that's, uh, that's, that's sort of what this situation represents. Do you have a question? Well, I think you sort of answered it, but I yeah. mean, wouldn't a lower Derek play yeah, not so have all, all entirely uniform samples? Because you'd still have some randomness. When right. You're not this is what You're happens. You're never going to live in a world like that. Well, in one sense, or yeah, I mean, I, the weight would have to be like you can. Zero, right? I mean, so y you can, and so yeah, the weight would be very close to zero. So imagine, imagine if your weight was literally 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, or your your Dirich light was literally 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.2. Right. I should have shown an example of that and done an example of that. I didn't. They would that would be very mixed up. They would have some with more reds, some with more right. blues, some. But in this case, I'm imagining, OK, what if you multiply this by a constant? And like, what if it's times 10 to the negative 10th on oh, each one? Okay. I see. That's essentially what this would look like um, you know, as it approaches 0. And again, you can imagine a real world situation like this, where you had, let's use coins now instead of restaurants. Like, let's suppose you had a bag of coins. You know they're all double-sided, but some of them had tails double-sided, and some of them were heads double-sided. You know, you might know the, the, the right, right, mixture right. of each one, but and that, what's interesting about this is, as soon as I observe a single, uh, a single value, I have a very good idea of where it's go where the rest of the, where the rest of the sample is going. You have a relatively good so, idea. You don't really know yeah, you don't really know. But you're right. I'm saying you know. He's saying you really know, and I'm saying how would you ever really be able to? Know? Well, it, it, if it's like that's the constraint of the problem. If like that's. If, if you know that all your coins are double-sided, but you don't know which one you have, then upon your first... Then if it looks on one side, you'll know the other side. Exa or, yeah, if you flipped it once, you'll know what uh, all the other flips are going to be. So this is just the extreme example. Okay. Um, most real-world examples are not like that, of course, but I'm just giving, like, this is the edge case of as it goes to zero. So, okay. So this is actually really exactly what happened in four square data in one look at it. So we had our positive reviews, the mixed reviews, and the negative reviews. And the real, um, and, and I'll get to how we 
uh, calculated this in a second. That's kind of the main point of the talk. But this is really what happens. Um, so, or at least in one version of this. I think th this must not be actual like, this must be, um, uh, hmm, you know what? I actually think, I actually think, to me, I feel like a lot of them are positive. I almost feel like the, I, I feel like I swapped the, the colors a little bit. I should have looked at this sw slide, but again, the weight was around 4.9 and the majority of them were neutral in this case. So one interesting prior, now you could do that over 100 and, uh, 168 dimensions uh, of when people are going to visit a place, uh, when you have very little visit data. And we actually came up with 168 dimensional prior on that. This is an actual... These are the weights of a Dirichlet prior. These, these do not add up to one. As you could tell, they add up to way more than one. The total weight is something like 30. Um, and so this represents a uh, distribution over a 168 dimensional simplex. Actually, it would be 167 dimensional because you lose a dimension. But, um, Another way to think of the distribution is an urn model. So let's suppose you have the Dirichlet distribution and the weights are one, one, and one. Then what you imagine is that you have, and this only kind of works when you have uh, whole numbers as your weights, but you imagine you have a set of data points and you have one of each because that's your prior, and then what you imagine is that every turn you take one example and then you put it back, but then you put back another one of the same color. So I pull out red, I get another red. Now in my next pull, I have a 50% chance of red. You know, And then if you do this an infinite amount of times, you'll get, it'll converge in some distribution and that is, um, and, 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 and that's kind of a, a pull from, that is a data sample from this Dirichlet that's one, one, one. So that's just looking at the same distribution from another perspective. And the intuition here is that if you already have a lot of points in here, then the distribution is kind of static. And even as you go to infinity, it's not gonna change very much. If you have very little, like three in this case, it could go anywhere. Um, so it's, it, it, you could see why when the weight is low, the uncertainty is higher. Okay. So that's... that's one, of these, one of these is arbitrarily placing the prior in the center of the simplex. Yes, yes. So I'm just saying this is, this is if I'm given this prior, this is how to think about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm just giving another way to think about like high weight and low weight. So because I, I had to come up with all these like intuition tricks to kind of figure no, out where it was going. Mean, yeah, that, that, that's sort of You don't have to pick one, one, one. Yeah. You're just... No, 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 I'm just giving examples. So for example, if I started here and I said this was my prior, then you're like, okay, now there's a much higher chance that like red's going to have the majority at the end, you know, if I started here. So um, that represents a much higher certainty state. Yeah. So it sounds like you're comparing, in the one case, you have one red, one yellow, one blue. Yeah. In the other case, you have 100 red, 100 yellow, 100 blue. Yeah, in that case, if you start with that, then you're going to end up very close to a third, a third, a third yeah, in the end. Each yeah. of those are starting with the same percentage, but the second one has more confidence. Right, right. So the third can end up, by the time it has 300 in there, yeah. it can end up very different from a third, a third, a third. And, but once you have 300 in there, you pull another million, it's probably gonna be around the same point. It's not, it's not a situation where a random walk where it can like run far away. What happens in these things is once you have a certain number of, of balls in there, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, remains, it remains the same, kind of self-corrects, so. I was thinking the exact same example, asked the exact same question, so. All right, <laughs> cool. Double answer that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, these are, all this explanation is exactly what I just said. Okay, so we'll come back to the count data. And so, great, 
So I have this count data. Let's say these are reviews, positive reviews, mixed reviews, negative reviews. Um, and I want to come up with a three category Dirichlet distribution that can form the prior of each row. And so you kind of think of it, well, how can I form a prior? And prior sort of indicates that you have, um, so, so, you know, there's sort of an open philosophical question, you know, what should my prior be if uh, I don't know anything about the problem? But in this case, we actually do know some stuff about the problem because we have lots of different examples. Um, you know, if you think about the problem of, you know, what are the chances that a coin that I get as change uh, at the store is going to be, you know, weighted differently from 50%. Well, you know, you just know from personal experience that almost every coin you're going to get is just going to be a pretty fair coin. And so that's just a personal experience. It's like in life you have that prior. Um, even though if it's a mathematical problem, pure math problem, and I said, well, I had a binomial distribution, I'm not going to tell you what it is, what's your prior, then you might be like, oh, I don't know what to do. Yeah. Actually, the, the no coins are not fair. American yeah. coins, like each coin, none of our coins are 50-50. Yeah. Each one is a, each one's a little bit off because of the, uh, the weight of the obverse and the inverse being different. That's good to They're know. They're pretty close. No. They're yeah. pretty close, but if you're flipping something like 50,000 times and betting on which is going to be more, you can actually... You which, know, which one is more? It, depend it depends on the, on the coin. Oh, yeah. I thought you were going to give me good uh, gambling <laughs> advice yeah. here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, they have computed it. There was yeah. a guy, uh, Percy Diaconis, or Diaconis, I don't yeah. know how you pronounce his name, who's done a lot of stuff with this sort of thing. Yeah. It's so pretty cool. Cool. So in this case, um, we, we want to find the prior for... For, so we're, we're going to find one prior for every row, and then the whole set of examples forms our, you know, experience. Um, you could say, well, this is our experience with this type of data, and so we can kind of mm -hmm. figure out what the prior is going to be from this. So we don't actually have to, um, we don't have to like guess a prior. Um, and so here's the picture that I have in my head. I have one, one Dirichlet distribution. On each row here, it produces another sample of um, a, a three-way categorical distribution. There's a different sample on each row. So each row has a different, um, a different three-way categorical distribution. And then um, on each row, I'm sampling a bunch of, of a bunch of points from that categorical distribution. That's why they're numbers. So that's the that's the idea of what's going on here. And so if you work your way backwards, you kind of ask, what Dirichlet parameters explain this data set the best? Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the, uh, and I know we're oh god, we're already an hour into it, but that's that's kind of the setup of the problem. Um, of, uh, of what we're solving here. And uh, I mean, I have a cool demo going on, but any questions about that? Because that's the main idea of what's, what's going, uh, of what we're thinking about here. Well, um, yeah. it's sort of a, on a different angle, but I mean, I still don't, and I guess I still don't have a, like in terms of actual practical stuff you did like at Foursquare, yeah. I mean, could you give like a nitty gritty example of like what, what the real, real world yeah, well, issue I mean... It would be like where you would apply all this... So the, you know, the question I, is... I'm not quite... Right. If I can... The, the idea is this. And again, um, you know, when you actually... When you actually implement this stuff in real products, you often have to add on a bunch of hacks and, uh, um, and like, um, and heuristics uh, to get it to work. But the idea behind this nice situation is if behind every venue I can calculate a distribution over where I think this venue lies in terms of how people think about it, about how it's going to be rated, then I take that distribution and say, okay, what product decision are we going to make off this? Are we going to say, 
well, it's too uncertain, so I'm going to display this, or it's certainly very good, so I'm going to display that. So I sort of, you know, on the engineering side, we create a probability distribution that we all understand. And then, you know, on the products, when we put our product hat on, we kind of think, okay, what do we, what do, we do with this? What's the next step? But to actually have that distribution calculated is kind of nice. If that makes sense. Can I extend, yeah. Extending Tom's question and add to this. So yeah. in this situation, you've got six rows of data. I take it the six rows represent six venues, to yeah. different places. And your point earlier was that each of those venues, you know, from a strict sense, should be thought about as having its own independent, you know, hypothetical categorical distribution, yes. assuming constancy over time and yes. uh, angular kind of assumptions. But then you're you're, you're going to meld the data and try to come up with you know, a prior for like the next one before you, or, or, or priors. Exactly. Right, you take it first. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that is, uh, yeah, yes, exactly. Uh, another thing maybe I took away from this too is that um, when you have uh, like sparse data that you're talking about, uh, it would still give you a uh, similar to like how you would have an intuitive model about like, well, you know what? Most people aren't going to give thumbs up to a place unless it's really good, you know, or something yeah. like that. So you might intuitively think, yeah, you know what? This is probably a really good place. Yeah, yeah. And so... Uh, and, and obviously this doesn't take into account like different people and well, all that. But we're, we're making a lot of simplifying assumptions yeah, here. So I, mean, I, just to, I, I just want to add that like I'm, I'm simplifying the product problem. So... I mean, you can make all kinds of... Yeah. It's a restaurant. What's the name of the chef? Is he famous? Does he have other restaurants? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All we, kinds of we did all that. <laughs> I mean, no, we didn't do name of the chef, but like, there were all sorts of complicated things going on here. So in this exercise, I sort of just extracted something that was kind of the essence of it and tried to come up with a cool model. But yeah. And, and was, that like your, was that kind of your motivating factor to get it to look at this distribution uh, because of the nature of the data and you made yeah. some intuitive sense about how to... Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was also the sense of, you know, I was asked the question, how many ratings do we need before we, before we know? And it's like, well, b before we're this certain. And it's like, well, what, what is this certain? How can we quantify that? What's the prior? Um, and so I thought about all these questions. Um, and yeah, and people have used this on their data sets and uh, they say that it is helpful and that, what I'm talking about is, is the calculator that I built. And I didn't build the first calculator, I just built a fast one, as I'll get to in a second. But like this, um, uh, um, yeah, this, this, this could be calculated. So how do we calculate it? Well, okay, the, um, you basically, so, so what this is, is a, it's a maximum likelihood estimate so we're taking ourselves away from Bayes in this case, although if I did this today, I might do it a little differently. But this is, this is good. Um, I want to find the Dirichlet parameters that best describe this data that assign it the highest probability score. And I could do it because I can calculate a gradient and a Hessian matrix this is a second order gradient. And I could use Newton's method to find the optimal point. Nice, nice. So just yes. One, one other just basic yeah. thing. Again, for people not familiar with Dirichlet, it includes me. Yeah. It's not going to be the same as just summing over the columns. Um, no. No, it's not. And it's because of the multiplicity and the correlation potentially of the different, you know. No. It, well, it's hard to get the intuition for me, but it sounds right. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, it won't be the same as summing because if you sum, well, these all have 20, so that's the problem. But in real life, they would not have yeah. plenty. Now, if you do sum them, it it could be. Gives you something that's not too far off. It could. It'll probably give you something that's not too far off from the but, uh, the, the the center of mass of the Dirichlet. But you can imagine a case where, like, uh, and this is actually kind of common in real world data, where like one row will have so many different, we'll, 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 we'll have so many more samples. Like you said, they're all 20 here. But what if one had like a million right. Right. and then the others had all like six and, and like it could dominate in a way that we won't. But if you normalize them and then add them, you probably get something pretty close. And if you, and if you sum them, you don't have a distribution over the distributions. Right, you're because just getting the center. 
I guess this, you could look at the standard deviation. Yeah. To the yeah. I don't think. Yeah. Down the columns or something. Yeah. But he's looking for the national likelihood. Yeah. Yeah. But I think you would observe here, right, that like every row has like one of the categories of dominating. Uh. And yeah. And so it. Just like looking at this data, for me, I would already think that the theory slate distribution is going to be this like the one that peaks toward the edges. Yes, yes. So it's going to be actually like a negative, or not negative, uh, uh, less than between, one. Between, yeah, less than one. Alphas. Yeah, that you have yeah, for this. exactly. Which like, I don't know an intuitive way to get to that yet, like just looking at these numbers, right? <laughs> the, the, the sort of yeah. what I see from the data. Okay, so we'll look at the calculator in a second. Um, but, so the difference between, uh, okay, so here's some, some work on doing this that I kind of discovered in the past. So there's this paper in 89 that says, okay, if you, um, if you look at the space, uh, if you look at the equations for this, it's concave, so for given account matrix, Newton's method will actually converge, so you're good on that. Some Fortran code in 1990, some MATLAB code in 2000, and the Thomas Minka code in 2000 is pretty good, but what it does is, so every step in Newton's method, it has to read the full data set, which in this case is not bad because there's six of them, but oftentimes you have a really, really long data set, millions and millions, or like let's say 100,000. So um, that could take a long time if you have a large data set. And so there are some tricks, some kind of algebraic manipulation tricks uh, that um, you can use to make this a lot faster. And essentially, and I'll show you how this happens in a second, you can have a machine, much like the mean machine, where you take each row individually and you compress it into a small matrix and a vector. Um, so in 2008, there's a little note in uh, Hannah Wallach, who's a researcher at Microsoft, um, that has something kind of approaching this approach. Um, and then her implementation is very good, which I, I don't think I don't think there's there's an open one that she has. Maybe 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 there is, uh, but interestingly enough, she owns Dirklay.net, so that's her personal website. Um, and then my paper in 2014, where I have this with additional Python code and MATLAB code, uh, plus the paper explains how the algebraic trick works, which I'm not going to go through all the all, all of that here, but I'll give you kind of an idea of how how it works. Um, and um, yeah, so setting up the problem, again, argmax just means we're looking for the maximum likelihood, Derek Lay. We have to take the first derivative of this, and that's the gradient, the first derivative with respect to all the alphas, and then we need the matrix of possible second derivatives, so you take the partial derivative with respect to one alpha, and then partial derivative with respect to another alpha. Um, and then so the equation boils down to the gradient and the Hessian. And then there's kind of this multidimensional uh, Newton's method type thing where you can apply it over and over again and it converges on a solution. Um, again, I'm trying to go only for intuition here. Um, but, oh, right. And so actually, I just want to show the paper real quick. Um, so that way, uh, what did I say to look on on the paper? Uh, last two equations paid four, and then equation nine and 10, so okay. Right, so this is the equation on page four, where it just says we're trying to look for the maximum likelihood, and then this is the probability of your count matrix, C, um, given any, uh, you know, 
any set of Dirichlet parameters alpha. So this is sort of putting the two together. It's putting the multinomial distribution and the Dirichlet distribution side by side and multiplying them together. And that's why there's a lot of stuff in here because all of the normalizing constants are here. <laughs> but you could see uh, you could see the main part of it. You could see the um, uh, yeah. You could you could see some of it. I'm not going to get into it here. So if we look at yeah, equations nine and ten, or is it at the bottom of this? Huh? Okay. Yeah. 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 So if you look at it at the oh here here it is. This is the equation that matters. Um, so essentially. There's no trick in here that is beyond like, uh, you know, high school calculus. It's just you have it's just really tedious and you have to be very patient with it. The main trick here is these gamma functions, which um, I'm sure a lot of you are aware that they act like factorials, and but you could have the gamma of a of a you know of a, of a fraction. So like what's 3.5 factorial. Um, and so the definition of that is really ugly. It's like this integral that can't really be integrated. But the nice thing here is the observation that, OK, if you have like 4 factorial divided by 3 factorial, that's just going to be 4. Um, and it works the same way if you have like 4.5 factorial, whatever that is, divided by 3.5 factorial, whatever that is, the answer is always going to be 4.5. So that always works. So if you manipulate the terms in the right way, you can use that fact to get rid of your gammas. And I take the log, so I, they're actually log gammas. And then you're introduced with terms that look like this. So now we have these log, log terms, but at least we're rid of all our gammas here. And that's what this ugliness is, but that's just being really patient and trying to get rid of the terms and then rearrange. And what happens is, OK, now I still have a lot of terms from my huge matrix. But what you notice with this log alpha k plus i, you notice that actually the same terms are going to come up over and over again. And so I, don't, I only need to compute a certain number of these. And so then you kind of ask yourself, OK, which of these do I need to compute? and then that's where you come up with uh, this um, uh, matrix and vector um, that essentially this equation boils down to this once you pre-compute this, this matrix U and this vector V, uh, which are given with these equations, which are just directly from the, from the counts. And then, OK, great, I drop a sum. And now it's a lot easier to do. So again. Not, I'm not trying to get everyone to go through all the algebra here. Um, it's been several years since I've been through it. I just, to get an idea of how it is, there's nothing too crazy going on here. There's just a lot of rearranging that you have to have a lot of, there's a lot that you can get done if you have a lot of patience. That's the bottom line. <laughs> um, okay, so if I view the uh, slideshow here. So what does this matrix and vector look like? So what I have here is the, Vector, so you set a number m, that's the maximum number of samples that I could take from each row. And if you think about it, it's okay to set a maximum because at some point you're going to get diminishing returns from getting more information from each row because you already have good information on what, the, what, that, what that multinomial is. And so the vector is going to be k times m, so that's the three colors in the first three rows sorry, the matrix, the three colors in the first three rows. And then the vector is just going to be of length m, and that's the bottom one. That's kind of a sum type thing. So the fourth row is special. That's like the totals. And how it works is this. So let's say that's your first observation, your first row. Well, you, and it, it's hard to see, but it added one to the, the white row as well. Here's the second one. You're only adding ones. So the second, the the um, the yellow one is three, so it just goes it just counts one two three from the uh, 
from the left, and it adds one to each one. See, and then because there's six total, it adds one, two, three, four, five, six along the bottom. <coughs> so you see how that update works? Okay, so this is all yellow, so it's gonna add one to every, col every yellow cell, and then it's gonna add one to every white cell. Now it's gonna add one to the first two green cells, the first um, yellow cell, the first red cell, and then the first four white cells. So that's sort of how this is updated. And so the analogy here is from what I built in the beginning is that it's a very simple kind of machine that takes into takes each row and computes this matrix and this, this total vector. And it's unclear why that's what we're doing, but this ends up being the total part of it, and it ends up kind of compressing the data into its essence, because once you get this, um, you can run Newton's method on this very quickly and get the, get the response. So let's look at the demo of the code real fast, and then, and then I'll, I'll look at some performance things, and then we'll see how it works. So let's see if I can make this a little bigger. Yeah. I'll move this over to the side here. So first I have a Python script that samples from a Dirichlet multinomial. In other words, it produces the data. And we're going to try to uh, I think we can go a little smaller. How's that? <coughs> OK. So if you look at the bottom, I'm sampling from it. Let's say I want. I don't know, uh, 10 samples. And each row I'm going to give, pull 100 data points. And then what's my Dirichlet going to be? There's no alpha, so it's A. Let's say it's 1, 1, 1. OK? So we're doing the uniform. That's what uniform data looks like. Now, if I change this to 100, 100, 100, that's the example that you gave mm -hmm. before. Um, they should all look roughly a third, a third, a third. See, look, it looks a lot more. Well, yeah. yeah, a lot, uh, a lot, a lot closer. Like that. Yeah, a lot closer. Um, if I'm sure, if I do a thousand, a thousand, a thousand, they're going to look a lot closer than that. Now, e even though most of these pulls are a third, a third, a third, you get a lot of variation because you're pulling counts from that too, and then that could go all over the place as well. So you don't necessarily end up with that. Now. Okay, let's look at some other things. Let's say, let's say they're different. Let's say the middle one is 10. Okay, you see a lot where the middle one is much higher than the rest. Um, let's look at, let's look at the 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, but the, the low one that we saw before. So 0 0.004, 0 0.004, 0 0.002. Yeah, there you go. That's the, that's the low weight one. And as you bring these up, they're going to look a little more mixed up. Still less than one, but now they're, most of them are in some corner, but some of them are not in the corners, but many of them are. But you see some zeros, but not, not entirely. Does this match up with everyone's intuitions? So, oh, yeah. So I have, I have a question. Yeah. So uh, I'm just trying to work with intuition. Yeah. If it's a natural number, if the number is huge, as it goes towards infinity, that yeah. means that you're very confident? Yes. But then as it goes to zero, you're also very confident? Uh, you're very unconfident because you don't know. So. No, I mean, the, the example with point zero zero four. Yeah, so let's look at that. Has, so. Yeah. You're very unconfident as you go into the row where the distribution is going to lie. It could be 100% on one side or it could be 100% on the other <coughs> side. So that's kind of, in a way, a measure of maximum uncertainty. Because it, be, it could be, wow, it could be way over there, it could be way over there. But what's interesting is that there's very few in between. Well, it's so it's almost, like, it's almost like asking this question, if I have a, if I have a normal distribution and the, uh, let's say the standard deviation is a billion, yeah. and then I ask, I pull something, you know, what are the chances that it's between negative a thousand and a thousand? The answer is very low. Very low. So it's oh, like it's going to be on one extreme or the other. 
Yeah. Oh, sorry. So I think I it's um this uh, point zero zero four. So this is like the rich get richer. This is like whatever the first one happened to be, then yeah. it just that takes over. So what yeah. we're it's mostly like most of the rich get richer effect. Yeah. As yeah, opposed yeah. to the actual distribution. Yeah. Exactly. And you still have a strong ratio between the alphas that determines the the frequency that you observe those different factors. Exactly. Exactly. So that although not very really well. Well, well if I gave, like, I, mean, like I guess if you did a hundred rows, rows four yeah, rows. if I did a hundred, you'd see that it's it's going to be. It'll be a lot better. Yeah, it's going to be a lot better. Um, but um, I, yeah, seems like just to try and give another example of the recommendation systems that this would be a very useful model for predicting uh, voting in like different counties because you're going to have like different de derivative weights. Yeah. The counties based on polling data, and then you could you could model out like voting patterns. It's interesting. Yeah, I I almost feel like this work could be used as like a building block in like a more complicated model, mm -hmm. just like an average can be used as a building block more complicated model. And that's a good example. It's like I wonder if there are some districts where you're pretty certain where it's gonna. Um, it's going to fall, but there are other districts that can swing wildly in each election. Well, there, there are absolutely districts yeah. like that. Yeah. There, was, yeah. there was a nice thing that sort of plays, he didn't use Jewish lay distribution or anything, but um, I think it was by Andrew Gelman. And he uh, looked at some of his cancer papers. rates yeah. in different counties. And first he showed a map of cancer, or some rare cancer. And he looked at the counties that had the highest rates. Then he showed the same thing, only with the lowest rates. It was like almost identical counties. They were right next to each other. So if you look at the first one, you assume it must be geographical. You see, what the second one, you assume it must be geographical, but the opposite direction, because mm. the next week, it turns out what it was was the size of the counties. Mm. Because when you have, there's a lot of counties that have almost no people in them. Yeah. So if you have one person or two people with yeah. this cancer, you have a huge percentage. If you have nobody, you have zero. Yeah, yeah. So, you know. so that's again the, the that's Which also like the sparse data this, problem. Yeah, it's like when you get this and you say, "Oh, it's a hundred zero zero cancer yeah. must be really high," but you really don't know what you're doing. Yeah, that's small. That, that's related to a more general point. It's not so much Max's angle on, on sampling units, but there's something called the ratio estimator. I mean, maybe it's easy to describe as the simplest case of that. You're looking at a bivariate distribution. And, and you're interested in the, the ratio of your total x and by the your total y. Yeah. And it turns out that, it, forgetting about sampling units, so I'm sure that's related, I've never thought that you could get that angle, but just some arbitrary number of samples. You take the sum of the x's and some of the y's. That turns out to be a common sense estimator called the ratio estimator that's widely used in practice. But it's known in a formal sampling sense to be biased, mm -hmm. not because of the sampling problem you talked about, about one unit having a really low zero, but because of the correlation between the, the potential, cor and, and in theoretical abstract space, almost necessary the idea that there's some correlation between the size, the, mm. the denominator, and the ratio itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, yeah, so I mean, it, was, that, it turned out, well, I don't know, we're getting pretty far. Yeah. 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 Well, I have, I have my grand finale here, so we got to, so the idea is I'm, I'm, I get a data set like this. Um, so now I'm going to use 4, 4, and 2 as my numbers. So remember, um, you could see that some of them have the first two bigger than the second one, but not all of them because 4, 4, and 2 is still kind of low weight, right? And so um, the question is, if I have a matrix like this, and let's say I do 100 of them like that, you know, can I then reconstruct the Dirichlet parameters that, that, that are used for this. And so that's sort of what that is. Find Dirichlet prior. I think I have to give it the number. And there it is. It's it estimated 4.5, 5.0, 2.2. But let's say I give it more data. So here I gave it 100 rows. Let's say I give it uh, 5,000 rows. Yeah, it's getting pretty close now. Uh, well, I, I should highlight. You just simulate 5,000 and then you're estimating from the simulation? Yes. Holy so holy. I simulate 5,000 rows. Fast. Yes. That's what, this, that's, that's what it does. Because what it did was it used that machine to, to yeah, compute, to move it, uh, to, um, to compress it into that matrix and then 
Newton's method is just like blah, 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 with these iterations because it just has to look at these tiny data sets each time. And then um, this is almost like the step in the mean th in the uh, mean machine. This is the step where we divide essentially. It's like it's it's uh, it's easy. So um, yeah, and it could get pretty close with with that amount well, of data. Oh, uh, four, 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 and two. Yeah, we could try other ones. Um, uh, let's say there were, let's say it's um, point one. One and one, uh, and this is the number I pull from each one. Let's say I'm still getting five thousand. There we go. Point. Here's the final example. Yeah. Yeah. So it used to be a whole like machine learning model. Oh, I'm learning. I'm get. You know. No, it's now just almost instantaneous. Is it significant that in both cases you were a little below the actual ground? That's a good question. I don't know. Um, it looks like it usually is. Oh, this one's above. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't. I haven't looked at it that fast. Yeah. No, it is. It is a, it is a maximum likelihood estimate, so that could have something to do with it. I don't know. The gradient size parameter in each of the lines that yeah. relates to like the newton raphson method. Yes, uh, okay. that's exactly what it is. It's just like, how, how far did it move? Mm -hmm. And then once it moves essentially zero, it says, oh, okay, I'm done. So, yeah. So, uh, I'm almost done here, uh, but I feel like there's going to be some good discussion, which I'm excited about. Just a little graph, so, so a few graphs that I made from mine uh, compared to things that were done in the past. The, the uh, fast fit, the blue one is, is the one from 2000, and then Wallach is the one from 2008. So it looks like there's a little bit of a difference, particularly when you have small, uh, small n. Um, but that's actually, it's a log scale, so it could be a big difference. But the interesting graph is here, where the pre-computation, which is actually reading, full the whole, reading the whole data, that's the, uh, that's the hard part. So you have to, in other words, reading those 5,000 rows is where all of the um, computation takes place, which is almost instantaneous when you read 5,000 rows. The only question here is, okay, 10 to the 7th at the end when I have to read a million rows, that's, uh, that takes a long time. But then cool. it's like, do I need to read a million rows to get a good answer? And the answer is not. And even not. then, yeah. 10 squared seconds, I mean, that's a minute and a half. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Um, so, but you probably, if you subsample it down to here, you'll probably get the same answer. Um, here's when trying to increase the number of samples per row again. And again, this is speed, so it's not necessarily, I didn't look as much, other than thinking about it intuitively, I didn't look as much into, does increasing M actually increase my accuracy? I feel like if I did more work on this, I would look at that, but again, um, if I had a small number of, if I have a small number of rows and I can only increase the number of samples per row, the M, you know, what happens in, in this case, it performs very, very well. Uh, and so that leads me to believe, and this is very hand wavy, but if I wanted to kind of combine the two, I would do some sort of a hybrid computation where the ones that had a lot of samples per row I would do differently than the ones that had fewer. Um, just different, different models that this could form a building block for. Uh, mixture models. Yeah, they're just ideas. Uh, latent Dirichlet allocation. I'm doing that for work right now. I'm not using this, but it's, um, yeah, it's used in a lot of places. So open it for questions. Um, check out my podcast. Um, also, I try, what I try to do is if I bring interesting math concepts on the show, and if some of you are interested in doing that, I try to do it at a very basic level, like for the average person, and so sometimes it's hard to do that in an audio format. So if anyone has ideas on how to do that, <laughs> let me know, because sometimes, I, think, I feel like the mathematical paradoxes one worked very well, but uh, sometimes, I don't think I could do this one uh, with that, but uh, that's, uh, that's always an interesting idea. But, yeah, um, okay, now I'm open to questions and discussion. And I thank you guys for your input because I feel like I had 
you guys have a lot of really interesting questions here. So. Why is it called Dirichlet? I mean, the mathematician who invented it, Dirichlet, uh, Dirichlet. Dirichlet, I think so, yeah. Like I was saying before we started, I think like that's not even in the top 10 things that he is known for. So, <laughs> yeah. But it still has his name on it. Yeah. So if you, I don't remember N, M, like the letters and stuff. Right, right. Imagine that you're repeatedly sampling from some distribution thing. Yeah. Is there a way to run the algorithm and have a sense of how close you are to the correct answer so you can cut off instead of being given a fixed amount of samples? That's a good question. So as I got deeper into machine learning and Bayesian inference and all that, I kind of moved away from maximum likelihood estimate and started looking at Markov chain Monte Carlo where it's like, okay, now I have a distribution over all the possible Dirk Lays that I have. And it's like, um, can I pull from that distribution? So um, I, maybe I would build something like that where it's like, okay, I can pull a bunch of possibilities and see are they all kind of roughly in the same ballpark. Um, but yeah, that's, um, that's an open question and a good one. Like, how do I know if I'm close enough? And then there's the question of, do I need more rows or do I need more samples per row? Mm -hmm. now, what I found out was if I had only two samples per row, then, because you need some sense of correlation, then so long as I let my number of rows go to infinity, I could ultimately converge on the answer. Uh, if I have only one sample per row, I can't do it because you can't tell the difference between the high weight and the low rate. Right? But um, is it better to get more samples per row or is it get a, better to get more rows? Is it, get, is it better to pull more categories from the multinomials or is it better to pull multinomial, more multinomials from the Dirichlet? It, it would be really cool from like a machine learning perspective to know like, okay, where should I, where am I subsampling too much like on the fly? I've never designed an algorithm that does that. It sounds like it could be a good thing to have. I think it would depend. Intuitively, it would depend on the nature of your data. If right. You, I mean, if you're in a world where everyone loves or hates each restaurant, yeah. and you're trying to get a characterization of that overall world, you need more rows. If, you, if you're yeah. in a world where there's a large correlation and a gray world, probably more like the actual world, but you need more data. For I guess the question was coming like, could you somehow figure that out algorithmically as you're reading in the data. What if you don't know what we're yeah. Huh? yeah. What if you don't know what yeah, we're you do But, but you do it on the fly. And let's say like each step, it could either ask it from, for more data over here or more data over here. And it's like, which, which place should I ask for it? With, with rating, getting away from the Derek I altogether, yeah. and the rating data, I know that in a lot of reading data sets, they don't even try to estimate the popularity because they know the people who do the ratings are not going to be a random sample of it. Yeah. Um, like if you do one to ten, you'll get yeah. a whole lot of ones and a whole lot of tens because people don't bother filling it out. Right. Unless they're pissed off or really happy. That's another. So how yeah. do you deal with that? I mean, at Foursquare or anyplace else. That's another thing in recommender systems. I mean, one is this idea that. If you have too many possible ratings, then people get confused. Like one to ten, people don't really know what to do with that. Um, well, and it, sometimes I don't know, but well, like, and then if you want to consider different users or different, it's it's more of like a. Um, oh God, I'm I'm blanking here, but it's the um, it's it's the matrix factorization model um, where it, there's there's a word for it. There's a there's a term for it that I use all the time that I forgot. Um, but there was something else I want to mention with regard to that. Because my degree, yeah. my degree is actually in psychometrics, and they use there's been actually my master's thesis was on differences between five point and seven point yeah. Likert scales, because that's what my advisor yeah. wanted to study. We, we had an interesting. <laughs> I mean, another interesting <laughs> point that we had is we had to normalized by language and culture because like you know oh different people will Japanese be yeah, 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 yeah were very yeah, positive yeah. and Russians were very negative so <laughs> <laughs> we had to uh, correct for that I was going to ask you about that earlier because you, 
the example of the word dinner. Yeah. But I know if, the, if you live in England, that means different things in different parts of the sure. country. Sure. That probably screwed up. Yeah. yeah. Like there are parts of America where yeah, dinner is at two in the afternoon or yeah. one in the afternoon. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, a, a lot of these, a, a lot of the stuff that I was showing today is kind of like a first estimate type of a thing, and ultimately you could use these techniques and sort of break it down into different subsections, um, I think is the answer for it. And that's why uh, oftentimes people just go to the different subsections immediately and they'll bother with this. Although some people, you know, like to have this Dirichlet calculator when they have data that looks like this and say, oh, I can run. Once you know you well, can run it very quickly, it's like, okay, why wouldn't I do and it? And you could use yeah. this as the dependent variable and model yeah. it on all sorts of things. I mean, from a different point of view, yeah. if you were looking at like psychologically rather than from the from four square, we would say, you know, why why are Russians negative and <laughs> and you know, Japanese positive, yeah. men versus women or older versus younger, right. or all kinds of things and come up with test yeah. psychological theories in a better way than they currently do. Because I've never seen Maybe. this used. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. I looking for more applications, so <laughs> certainly that could be cool. Yeah. Uh, I've got another question. You, you were talking about how you, uh, were, you were, in terms of your building your Hessians and all that stuff. Yeah. Eliminating factors and getting rid of the Those uh, hands. That your your factors are not approximations. You're, these are these are exact solutions, but um, there are no assumptions built in. It's just it's just Newton's method. You know, I mean, there are certain errors, right? I mean, in, in any kind of Newton's method. Sure. To, you know, there's like a tolerance and a, and a it's an iterative solution, but. Um, Aside from sort of standard method type errors, there's not there's no corners cut. Um, no, no. The only error is, is if you're like subsampling your data. Um, I mean, when you have this type of data, there's so much variations in the data that any that anything can happen anyway. But yeah. Right. If you could have store bad data. Or yeah. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, no, it's an, it's an exact one. So I one comment just. I think it's cool how it breaks down into uh, like your time complexity and your space complexity. So your, yeah. your time complexity is like exactly the number of rows that you're going to read in, and your space complexity is like the, side, the number of uh, samples that you're going to take from each row. Yeah. In terms of like what you're storing as you're doing this. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's so. It's nice how it decomposes into those two parameters. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That was uh, that was a surprise, and that was. That was done just, you know, being really patient with the equations, <laughs> working with them, and getting getting a room by myself, <laughs> you know, being like everyone else. So then, a, a question. Um, yeah. So if we do move into a more Bayesian, we're going to model. We're going to put priors on our alphas. Yeah. Um, so all the all the yeah, Dirichlet and beta regressions that I see. Are all assuming, or are, are, are usually modeling high weight um, cases, yeah. And, and so they put particular um, uh, distribu prior distributions on these that are going to be leaning toward like positive above one. So what's it going to yeah. prior for if you don't have a belief about whether or not it's going to be this low weight or negative weight? Like, in other words, what's your sort of un in other words, we want to bias the. Uh, so the now we're going a third right? level up. Uh, do we want to bias that a little bit? Like um, right now, I'm assuming some kind of um, uniform distribution on the alphas. Like I'm not. I mean, do we want high weight or low weight? I. I tried experimenting with some of that a little bit, but I never got very far. It, I think I, I just didn't have time. But okay. yeah, but I think I, and well. Not only did I have time, it made my code really complicated, and so that, and then it made my conceptualization of it really complicated. So I feel like if I were to do that, or if anyone were to do that, you'd have to really like focus. But uh, I think you can get it. Yeah. Or maybe I just have trouble focusing well, when I go so many levels up. <laughs> but uh, no, I thought about that, and like, there could be a situation where you're building a model and you like want it to be high weight, like you don't want it to give you like. Like if you have a mixture model, you don't want to give it a low weight one where it's going to add stuff to each of the corners. Like that could be a little weird. So you want it to fit in. I don't know. Um, 
but yeah, in, in the real world situations, a lot of them that would come up with are high weights. Like, this was a good one, um, actually, the 168 dimensional one. Uh, the background behind this was that we were using visits as um, an estimate of how busy some place is going to be uh, at any given hour, so that we kind of could rank the popularity of the place. But the problem is a new place, it would assume it's going to be equally busy at 4 a.m. and 4 p.m. And that we just knew intuitively is obviously not something that you should assume from the get-go. So it was cool. Now, could somebody uh, have just made this up and been like, okay, we're going to make an assumption like this and then we'll go from there and we'll use this to smooth our data and it looks pretty good. You know, product is good. Yes, you probably could do that. But the fact that we could compute an optimal one was just pretty cool. And then, you know, some people have told me like, hey, mine looked, when I computed it, it was a little better than the one that, than I, that I made up. But uh, yeah, I want to experiment more with like mixture models and things like that. Try to get yeah, I'm thinking, I was thinking at the beginning about, and then I sort of lost track, but on frequentist applications of this, I don't think it has to be Bayesian. No, I mean I think you know there could be there could be frequentist ways to use this as well. Uh, but um, when you were starting, I was thinking, you know, you could do this frequentist, and then as it got deeper into it, I sort of lost the track of that. But it yeah. doesn't seem like it has to be Bayesian you know. to solve this particular problem. Right? No, like, no. But yeah, the um, I guess the. I mean, if you were modeling this. Yeah, again. I mean, wait, Peter, you, frequentists are just, nobody disputes the validity of Bayes' theorem. People who are philosophically frequentists are un, unhappy with. Priors. You get unhappy with priors yeah. and things like that. No, but Bayes', Bayes rule is not, yeah, right. Bayes Bayes rule is not in dispute. Right. Yeah. And in fact, the Bayesian frequentist wars have just yeah, pretty much disappeared they because down. they wind up giving the same results anyway. Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> unless you just <laughs> get Often. the wacky priors. And Often. Just yeah, if you do. likelihood estimate. You know, so. Well, now, nowadays, like, and people use ML, and we've shown a lot of the ML models, like all the regularizations. Well, regularization in a lot of statistics is just crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. actually wrote a poem for each group mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, a Bayesian fellow named Myers said, tenure is all he desires, but his dreams won't be met. He'll be fired, I bet, when they catch him adjusting his priors. <laughs> <laughs> just because you know you want to be balanced the frequentist fellow named yeah. Smith kept silent he pleaded the fifth when the judge inquired were the assumptions required to calculate p-value squared so you know it's all and both of them have yeah. nonsense in them any more questions or, or consume for consumer yeah mm. I, I have some food for thought just this yeah. is not about the Jared Flay but about something that was said earlier that our, our friend Andrew Gelman has a paper where he says that there's no such thing as a biased coin. If you flip a coin into the air, and then, I, I know people like do coin tosses different ways, but if you flip it into the air, catch it and put it on the back of your hand, um, there's no such thing as a biased coin because, because of conservation of angular momentum, the coin spins at the same speed all the time. So if you catch it at a random time, you get a random side. If you catch it at a random time. Yes. Mm. That's well, maybe, maybe whoever said earlier, I don't have any opinion on this yeah. issue, but I think Peter, you said they were. Yeah, but that's when it maybe lands. Maybe data, it lay on, lay on the table. It's, 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 it's possible the, if you spin it on the table. The data actually, but it may be in an idealized world, but the actual data disagree very slightly. I in mean, Gelman's paper. But okay. it depends how the setup. I mean, I like Gelman argument. Yeah, but it's like even if you heavily <laughs> weight one side, it yeah, won't but bias. Maybe his setup or, or is laying on the table versus in. No, no, it's possible, but it has to be like it can't even be a regular spin. It has to be sort of um, a you can load a die. So if you have if it, you, I mean, if you, it's also probably depends if you grab it out of the air uh -huh. or if you let it fall. Let it fall like Diaconus was letting it fall. Yeah. So that's going to be it's different. Possible. He's a pretty established guy, so if he published it, it's probably right. <laughs> huh? If, if, if Diaconus published it, it's, I'm sure it's you know. Well, Gelman is. is yeah. Uh, I, mean, I, think, uh, I mean, these are two. They were asking different questions, though, I think. I think Gel like, you know, Gelman is asking about grabbing it out of the air, and Diaconus is asking about lay land, letting it land on the table or letting it land on your palm or something. So. And also the angular momentum. Well, I guess the angular momentum would have to be constant. Yeah. 
Um, anyway, uh, thanks very much.